This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale Live demo at www.rationale-online.com. The Staff Canteen now has its own shop, so you can get your hands on as much merch as you want. From mugs, t-shirts, to these hoodies, which you'll see myself and any of the guests on our podcast wearing throughout. Go and take a look. The link is below. And please do give us a thumbs up if you do decide to purchase anything. Finally, we are giving away one hoodie per episode for the next six episodes. You can find out how to win at the end of this podcast. Thank you for listening to Grilled, the Staff Canteen podcast. Cara has asked me to let everybody know that these podcasts may contain some swearing, some explicit language, and some topics not for the faint-hearted. No offence is intended, and please listen at your own discretion. Welcome to Grilled. I want to eat from the roof whenever I want to eat from the roof, not when you want me to eat it. I just remember Brad's smell of his beard. You just had the biggest, fluffiest beard, and I was like, God, he smells so good. <laughs> I don't know why, it's weird. Sometimes you put smell or something to it, and I just remember that, of course, a bit bizarre. Why are you in your chef's white cellar? Are you working? I'm cooking burgers. <laughs> oh, burgers! <laughs> I hope they're not McDonald's. And I just lash it all over the hot toast as it melts and quickly munch it up, crunchy, crunchy, munchy. Dying to get like a piece of your culinary penis in or around <laughs> their mouth. Uh, welcome to Grilled, a podcast by The Stuff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Stuff Canteen, and it is my uh, third episode with my lovely co host Alex Claridge from the Wilderness in Birmingham. Alex, you hit the headlines since the last episode that we recorded, didn't you? I've done some things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did you do? Well, uh, in short, I spoke to the Daily Mail, which was a mistake. Um, if you say something to the Daily Mail off record, they will use it as the headline. Um, and it turns out if you're in the midst of a hot-headed disagreement with uh, the anti kind of vax, uh, anti-mask community, referring to the size of their penis will cause trouble for you. So, <laughs> Who knew? I mean, it, it, honestly, it's been horrible. I mean, I, bizarrely, just for this phone call, we've just had another like fairly major um, flare up on it so uh yeah after this phone call i'm gonna have to go and deal with more uh more nonsense. I, I don't know i just think it's been mad um you know obviously the 19th onwards we've all had choices to make in restaurants and you know our choice wasn't even that mad like what we actually did is just said look we're going to be a bit cautious keep some of the measures internally we'd love it if you work with us but the choice is yours i never thought it would be contentious but Honestly, I've just had like, you know, I've had 500 messages so far threatening to either burn down my house or my restaurant or, um, you know, the one today, uh, someone's very kindly sort of posted a very long review of how I'm a, a fat, disgusting mess, which, you know, given the eating disorders I had when I was 18, hits pretty, uh, pretty well. She's done, she's done a job there. And uh, it's just been unrelenting, really. And like, what seems to me is there's this anger and division that, um, no one really knows what to do with it, right? And I sort of feel like, unfortunately, because I do have a habit of giving back as good as I get, um, I've sort of, I've become like sweet honey <laughs> all that anger and they are all bees. Um, and well, you don't take it to heart. It has to go over your head. The people, uh, I think people find it so easy to be mean these days as opposed to just moving on with stuff that's not related to them you're dead right of course you are that is the advice but I think any chef will vouch that however hard you want to sound or how much you want to be like oh no yeah I don't know don't give a fuck like eventually it hits you know once you've gone over like a hundred of them you kind of just go it's a lot you know it's a lot and how can you argue with someone who's telling you that Prince Philip isn't dead and is currently based on like an island outside the country orchestrating a conspiracy campaign to fake COVID, like you can't argue with that, right? You can't argue with that level of total madness. And, and that's no. what I'm dealing with. Um, so yeah, this, this, this is a ray of light. No pressure, Ellie, but you're, you're, um, <laughs> you're the only hope I have of retrieving the day from total ruin. <laughs> well, let's 
introduce um, Ellie properly, shall we? So um, why did you want to have Ellie on the podcast? Um, tell us a bit about that. Well, I thought I made that clear because I believe Ellie can somehow retrieve my mood from the basement. Um, no, I, I think Ellie is um, just increasingly someone who kind of, I'm hearing about, I've not had the chance to eat at Ellie's restaurant yet, but you know, I've got several friends who it's kind of one of their pilgrimage sites. So when they go down to that part of the world, you know, to do one professional cookery show, you know, we can forgive that to do two smacks of madness. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I, I think everything I've seen and heard for me is this is just someone who's kind of like, bang on the money for what hospitality should be what customers want doesn't seem to drag themselves into all this silly like chefs getting in trouble in the press and like you know saying stupid things and offending people like you know it doesn't do that just kind of consistently everything i hear is that you know this is a real talent just putting her head down and doing her own thing and you know when we spoke i kind of said look i i, I don't just want to speak to you know all of our peers who are you know veterans with you know four or five michelin stars whatever it is um you know i want to speak to sort of people who i think are the the you know the future right the future of hospitality that was kind of our brief um i don't include myself in it i'm sort of like you know ford fiesta at the back of the lot that you might be able to sell but it's probably not gonna you know not gonna go very far uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, I thought well do you know what um whilst i'd very much love to to be able to kind of get down down south and, and uh, you know, eat Ellie's cooking and I absolutely will do. In lieu of that, I just thought, let's, you know, let's get Ellie on. Let's hear what she has to say for herself. Let's let's understand her journey and see what her take is on this, this baffling industry that we all inexplicably keep doing to ourselves. Absolutely. Well, Ellie Wentworth, welcome to Grilled. <laughs> Thank you. Honestly, that was really sweet. It's actually touched me that, especially in these sort of times. Uh, thank you for the jumper as well. Just want to put that out there. Um, the invoice yeah. will be on the way for the jumper. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, it's actually, it is quite nice. Uh, <laughs> Don't sound surprised. <laughs> no, it's really, like, I'm not a jumper person, especially down here with this weather. You know, it's boiling hot today, and obviously we're on the seafront, so the sun comes beaming in. Um, yeah, I mean, it was quite surprising that I got asked to do it. Like, I've always... I've in lockdown, I was always listening to all of them, Daniel Clifford, um, to be, and it was like my little hour in the morning, listening to the podcasts and like giggling to myself and Chris Tanner one. And I mean, I've always liked listening to everybody's stories because everyone has a story to tell. And it's something that every chef can relate to. And obviously in lockdown, you know, everyone needed to do something or do a hobby or at least try and keep themselves motivated because for me I've had the most time off I've ever had in my whole career and five months in one time is it's pretty it's massive it's a long time like you know the the five months all I was thinking about was what I'm cooking for dinner rather than you know how many covers we've got in the restaurant right are you both ready for these questions not really but let's go <laughs> Uh, a number between one and six. Ellie? Eight. Yeah, <laughs> someone else who got tripped. Oh, no. Between one and six. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, five. Five. What's something you think everyone should try at least once? Sea urchin. Okay. Just straight out of the, straight yeah, out of the shell. I don't like it, and I won't ever try again. But it's something I feel like everyone should try. That's a good one. I am I'm on the same page as you there. Have tried it and didn't like it. It wasn't for me. Not my cup of tea. Alex, have you had it? I've had it a couple of times. I've had it and I've really enjoyed it and I've had it and I've kind of been underwhelmed. I feel like most things, it's sort of context yeah. and, and quality of it. But yeah, I mean, I'd take it or leave it, you know. I'd eat it again, but I wouldn't be like, let's open a sea urchin themed restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> You might have some in their mind. <laughs> if anyone's yeah. listening and they want that, then uh, we'll do that. Like we'll <laughs> <You'll> license it. <laughs> right, Alex, give me a number between one and six, not five. Uh, one. 
Um, if you were stranded on an island, what would you choose to take with you? Oh. I think I've been clear over your searching. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, like, I'm going to sound bougie as hell here. Like, the best thing I got during lockdown was, like, this carbonation thing so I can make my own sparkling water. Because... <laughs> I love a bit of San Pellegrino. I do like it, you know. Um, and I feel like, let's face it, death will come. But I believe you can go hungry longer than you can go thirsty. If, if I'm going to cop it, I'd rather have like sweet, sweet bubbles dancing on my tongue right till the end. So yeah, my carbonation rig for sparkling water. I like that. It's a good one. That's a good one. Um, Ellie. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Uh, do you have any weird superstitions? No, not really. That's a no. hard question, Cara. Um, <laughs> no, over to you, Al. <laughs> oh, Alex, three, four or six? Three, please. Uh, what happened on your worst date ever? Relationship date? Yeah. That's where she's getting at, I believe, Ellie. <laughs> trying to reflect that some discomfort. Don't, <laughs> don't name and shame it. <laughs> I, I, I would never do that. Um, to be totally honest with you, I just not I've not had that many um, that many bad dates. Like I'm sort of um, yeah, like I, I think quite blessed with that. Like I've absolutely had sort of you know first dates where you sort of go and you're like, this makes zero sense. What am I doing here? Help! But um, no, like, I've, not had any, I've not had any kind of real real disaster. Uh, I appreciate. I think Cara must have thought this is a great question to ask Alex. Obviously. <laughs> I mean, look at him, like, if he's not sort of had to <laughs> down a drain pipe at some point. But um, no, it's, 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 it's been very tame, actually, Cara. Thank you for oh. your judgment. Okay. Well, you picked it. Could have been Ellie. I, I picked the number three. I thought you were going to ask me about my philosophies, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> Ellie. Uh, four. What makes you feel old? But then if that, I don't know if you ever feel old because you're so young. <laughs> What makes me feel old? God, I don't know. Well, I'm 30 this year, and I am the oldest one in the kitchen. Do you understand anything that your kitchen team talk about? That's a good litmus. <laughs> Possibly the words or the slang, I suppose. Um, yeah, I understand none of it. <laughs> but all like the new like drum and bass or something like that, and it's like, no, no, what happened to like old school music and things like that? Yeah, they, 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 they listen to such loud... <laughs> <laughs> all I want is Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, yes. You know what, Alex? I play that all the time in the kitchen. Dreams. Oh, what you know, what, it's a vibe, right? It's a vibe. <laughs> like when, you've got, when you've got an absolute shitter of a job, like use <laughs> all like you know, dicing, you know, brumoir to get a set up for stocks. Like Fleetwood Mac is the best choice. Uh, you know, I don't care what anyone has to say otherwise. How are you supposed to work in methodical fashion, listening to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so right. <laughs> that does my nut in. Final question, uh, Alex. What's your favourite snack? Um, Obviously, it won't have carbs in it. No, no, it won't actually. Not since I, yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> after the the barrage of insults around my personal appearance, my fondness for uh, you know snacks during lockdown. My favourite snacks oxygen actually. Um, <laughs> Do you know what? Like, okay, this is weird. Um, hummus, but ideally with zero seasoning. I have a really like formative memory. Like, I didn't grow up in a particularly foodie family. Um, I sort of feel like there's two roots into cooking. Either you grew up around food and like, you know, it was always part of your life and that carries on, or you didn't, you know, your mum was you know, well, your mum was part of Iceland's key demographic and you didn't okay. eat particularly well, um, not particularly badly, like you know, you didn't eat gourmand um so you sort of you go out on a little mission and one of the first things i remember eating and being like if you take the piss i'm gonna be really really upset and i know that someone sat on this call not you ellie will be rude about it um when i was about 16 17 my first girlfriend her mom used to be a bit of a kind of waitrose sort of mum if that's survived. nothing wrong with that a lot right with it ellie a lot right with it <laughs> Um, and she used to make hummus, but she didn't believe in salt. So she made this like really neutral, like clean hummus. 
and serve it with those little tiny pita breads that um that you used to get from like MS or, or waitrose and stuff and like i know it's a really mad thing to fixate on but like i'm quite obsessive like it would answer my superstitions it'd be a three-hour podcast <laughs> Like, yeah, I remember just how clean it was. I remember like the cleanness of flavor, how kind of neutral and sort of almost sort of like the kind of food you want to eat when you're sick, because it's not really got anything happening, like without salt, right? Hummus actually is just really, really neutral and bland. Um, but I still, that that's kind of like a comfort snack. Like if I'm working, like, you know, particularly if I'm like on my laptop or like running the business or doing the admin side, like, yeah, so like, did you steal her recipe for the neutral I mean, hummus? Uh, make hummus, but don't add salt. Is yeah. that it? It's just that. It's as simple as that. A load of olive oil in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you know, just, 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 you know, pure kind of, uh, you know, like baby food for grown-ups. Um, so, like, yeah, like that, that's my go-to kind of comfort snack. And, I mean, it only gets weirder from there, really. But um, yeah. I think hummus, that's a good one. That's a, that's a good snack. I'm, um, I'm on board with that snack. I'm delighted and surprised. <laughs> My snack is a little bit more on the naughty side. Um, I have a fond lover of crumpets. So Nothing wrong with that. I'm going to put my hands up here. I can have butter on the crumpets because it's just not for me. But I like salad cream and I slap it on the what? crumpets. Okay, like... Wow! When I said <laughs> nothing wrong with it, that. and it oozes in the holes, and it's <laughs> delicious. And I, I, you know, I have a cheeky one now and then. And it's, yeah. obviously the team don't agree with that because they think it's absolutely disgusting. But you know, I could say the same about Marmite. I'm not a fan. Bless you. If it works for you, then more power to you. That is not <laughs> what I expected. <laughs> no. Did that come about because you had nothing else to put on your crumpet one day? No, this is obviously going to come across proper. I'm going to probably get rinsed for this, but I can't have butter in my sandwiches. And I've had this such from a young age, even like Simon Olsen, a female. Like when I was in there and we was having sandwiches, like I couldn't have butter on the sandwich. I need it dry. Like I'm just, but I use a ton of butter in my food. And I eat it in pom purees and mashes, but I just physically can't have a slab of butter on a piece of bread. Like it will make me feel sick. So either dry or salad cream. So I went with the salad cream, and yeah, it's been a forever lover since I was a young age. Wow. I mean, the team think I'm fucking crazy, but you know, go. It's what you like, isn't it? Well, I think that's something that everyone should try at least once, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not loads, but just enough so it oozes in the holes. <laughs> that recipe will be available on Staff Canteen on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. brilliant! Oh, thank you both for being <laughs> for being so honest. That was really good fun. Um, let's move on, Alex. Where do you want to start? So you know, one of the things that uh, you know. I think feels really timely or poignant because I, I don't know how you found it with staffing, but you know, a universal theme and a lot of the kind of chats we've had so far with chefs, both on this podcast and more broadly is, you know, looks like we've got a bit of a staffing situation. Certainly we don't have, um, I mean, I think it goes deep in that. I don't think there's the people that used to be around. There's not the, the kind of talent available for, for hiring as stands, but I also feel like this is very much a time where post lockdown, everyone's kind of reevaluating the industry and how it dovetails into their existence as a human. Um, so I sort of feel like a great place to start is sort of why chefing? What, what, you know, what, what hooked you in? Um, um, so I started when I was obviously KP and I mean, I think you're right. You're either round food or your parents are a good cook or there's someone in the family that's the chef, but um, I didn't have anyone in the family that was chefing. Um, I just worked in a local pub when I was 13. And at the time it was all about the little bit of a pocket money at the end of the week. Um, obviously my dad was like quite strict with, you know, if you want money, you know, go and get yourself a little job or newspaper round and try and earn yourself money. So um, yeah, I was working in a, young, a pub, uh, doing KEP in, um, and then one night the chef was short and he said, Ellie, can you jump on and start cooking? And I was like, Jesus Christ, like, 
you know, I was like 14, didn't even know what a mussel looked like, let alone garlic puree that they had on their shelf. And he was like, put a bit of that in, put a bit of that in. Um, and I really started enjoying it. Um, and then they started asking me back to go into the kitchen. And from there, it just, I thought to myself, like, dad, I really want to do cooking and I want to go to college. Um, he was like, you know, have a look at it properly. And then at the time, um, I went to Plymouth College, level one and two. And I just really enjoyed the atmosphere and the push and the passion and just at the time when you're young, you're learning new things and you don't know what bread is, you don't know what a treacle tart is. And you're just, I think it was more of what was in that piece of food rather than, you know, doing, doing it as a job at the time. And I just really, really liked it. And I, then I wanted to go and work in a rosette place. So I started looking around at the time. My boyfriend was working at Gidley Park. So um, I went to the Tanner, Tanner Brothers in Plymouth and that was my first proper insight of like professional cookery um you know the hours the the sections um I was like 17 at the time and you know for a 17 year old now to walk into the industry is completely different to when I walked into the industry like there was so many chefs you know the Tanners at the time was the best restaurant in Plymouth so I always I always wanted to work in the best place that I could even if it took me ages to write a letter keep nagging them ringing the phone and my dad was like just keep ringing Ellie they're gonna get annoyed just keep ringing and I'm like and it's like my dad's been always one that's like never give up and it's always a challenge and you know it's he's he still says it today like come on Ellie you know you know you can do it so keep fighting and since then and I obviously really enjoyed it was like two three rosette um food and then obviously it was I, my boyfriend at the time was in Michelin then, and I was like, right, do you know what? I think I can try this. And I went straight to the elephant, um, to Simon's, and it was just a different outlook, different outlook of anything. It's, I don't know, it's like hard to tell, but I learned in all these Michelin star restaurants something different, and I think that's what's really intriguing. As a young chef at the time, you know, the hours are tough, and yeah, I did cry, and yeah, I did want to, like, walk out at times, but... I never did because I always wanted to prove that I can do it. And as a female, I think that's quite massive. Like I wanted to show the chef that I could do the same hours as a guy or I can go in there and do the section and not let anyone down. But at the same time, you're learning and it's a constant thing for me is if you've got the great attitude and you're always on time, you've got an iron chef, right? You can teach any person. And that's how I look at it as an outlet. Like my chefs, I started from them with nothing. And today we're, you know, the reputation and the customer feedback and what we're trying to do at the Angel is like, we're really pushing and every day is a new day. Um, and I feel like it's really helped from, you know, Hal Jones at Lucknam and Simon. And it's just a different outlook of food and your personality. And once you get that, I think you nail it. Sorry if I babbled on then. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is your hour you can That's do that. it you so please no i mean it's, it's one hell of a journey and like you know i think this past that that yeah like you know resonate i think i think the learning thing's a big one it is uh, i think the fact that even when you get to that point where you know i don't know how it's for you this is where i find out that i'm just really shit but like there's never a point where i'm like cool we're you know this is as good as it can be or oh cool like this isn't really, I don't think, a kind of career where you ever get to, to, to settle or kind so, of like yeah. relax into it. And I still think if you do relax into it, that's that's the danger zone, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I agree. Like, I think now at this stage, I think everyone's concentrated on actually getting bums on seats rather than everything else. And at the beginning, when I started in May, that's, I did generally feel like we need to make sure that we're busy and that's all that matters. If we're busy, I have staff and I can remain staff. Like if you haven't got a busy restaurant, you're screwed. And, you know, I never want to be in a position where I want to let chefs go because we're not making the money. And that was my huge number one. And now we've got, we're, we're well, we've smashed that out, out in the first month. And now it's like thinking, well, what's the next plan? And, you know, for me, it's obviously the food and teaching the guys, but there's always something in the future and I'm, for me, the angel, I want it like it was with Joyce Wananew. It was like one of the best restaurants in the country. And 
everyone from London and across every, the country was just coming down to eat her food. And for me, that's amazing. Just to, like you said, a lot of people are hearing my name. Now, I, I'm other than food related or staff related, I don't really put too much on social media because I try and keep myself to myself. Don't like being vocal. Um, you know, I obviously vocal around the town is a bit different. <laughs> but, I mean, like social media. Um, but yeah, like really try. And I've got a young team, um, you know, obviously, unfortunately, um, my head pastry chef did like, well, he's had cancer and he's not been with us since December. And it's been really, oh, I get a bit upset, but it's been really tough. Obviously, he's like the partner in crime. Obviously, I've got four young ones and then Craig, and obviously Craig passed away yesterday. Um, and yeah, it's just, oh, it's getting, you know what it's like. It's like trying to build the team back up again. And, you know, it's for me, everyone in there have been with me for three years and from the start to now it was I can't even describe it was so hard like I came here and there was like two for dinner and I'll be ringing my dad I'll be like dad I think I've made a mistake here like I've got two people for dinner like what the fuck's going on and I sort of related to Paul Ainsworth's post he did like two years ago and he put he did a vid he did something and he was saying that him and Emma used to go to the cinema on a Wednesday night because he used to have no one in. And like when he first started at his restaurant, he used to have like two, three, four people. And now he is the busiest man probably in the Southwest. And, you know, for me, it's like when I first started here, it would be like two people for dinner. I'm not even joking. And I'll be like, this is fucking shit. Like, what have I done? And from there to now, to be fully booked for three and a half months, I feel like we've really succeeded and obviously with the help of like Craig and the team, like we're really trying to push and yes, yeah, it's, it's, you know what I'm trying to say, but I feel very lucky to be at the Angel at the moment. I mean, I actually think, I mean, I'm going to disagree. I don't think it's luck. I think, I think maybe it's a great platform for you, but I actually think the fact that your team are clearly so important to you, like, you know, yeah, even, they mean the world to me. You know, when we spoke before the phone call, like, you know, the fact that, you know, you've, you've, you've been kind enough of to share your time with us when obviously you've had a really, really difficult few days. Mm -hmm. Like your concern is always about your team. Your concern yeah. is always about your team. And like, I don't know, like for me, that's one of the kind of commonalities with, I think, you know, a lot of kind of folks who are, forgive the expression, because I, I sort of think like it's bollocks, but we'll use it because I don't know a better one. Like, kind of on the way up, right? Or sort of like, you know, like that crescendo of their, their journey. Like, I mean, I don't know where they're on the way up to. I don't know what the goal is. Surely the goal is just to do good food and be happy. But, you know, there is this kind of modernity. And I don't think it's good luck. I think it's, you know, it's the fact that, you know, you maybe with your dad behind you going, come on, come on, have it. <laughs> you know, yeah. determination and sort of like, remembering that it's, it's sort of without a team. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, just it's, it's really nice to hear yeah. amongst all of the kind of negativity that is so easily surrounding the hospitality industry at the minute. So it's really nice to hear you talking like that about your team. And I can get a, they're yeah. obviously like that your family almost that like, yeah. they are, and they, like, it is. You're so right. And obviously, when I first started here, I was 26, and obviously, you know, you put it on papers. It is quite young to be a head chef and um when you when I first walked in there they're probably thinking you know like I have had Michelin star experience you know they haven't you know they've come from like little places around Dartmouth or Kingswear Rockfish Mitch Tonks etc and you know for me I've they're almost like a mini me like I've trained them up there you know I I didn't have a sous chef at the time obviously I had Craig head pastry chef but for me I didn't want a sous chef because I didn't want them someone else teaching them I wanted me to, I want me to develop them to the best they can be and right now then when I get like a sous chef they're almost it's I'm in the background and like for me the next last three years of developing them is like really important to me it's like every day you know it is it's like having family brothers and sisters and you know obviously I'm the head chef obviously but it's like I'm almost 
they're such a young team, almost like their mom, should I say? It sounds ridiculous, but obviously they go to me for everything, and obviously trying to run a restaurant and trying to run a team with the news and what's going on at the moment. You know, they've really they're very magical. They're very good, very I, good. And I, I think you know, I think it's the way forward. You know, I think it sounds like you've just sort of intrinsically got it, but like the, the longer I've done it for, like, I couldn't agree more. You know, like. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm lucky enough. I've got a head chef, you know, Marius, and and you know, I suppose. But like you say, Al, you're only as good as your team. Well, and without your team, you're fucked. It's you? Further down the line, like you know, the, the 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 more you actually focus on seeing them do well and celebrating their talent and trying to just make them better than you, and trying to, as you say, get yourself to point where you can in the background and be there for them where you can add value. But like the rest of it, it's actually I think the way you you build something great. And like greater than the sum of its parts, right? Like, no, uh, you're right. What um, one of the things that I think I found dead hard, still sort of do, but like, you know, a lot of the guests we, we sort of have on have you know obviously got that freedom. They're head chef. That they've got that that control. If you had to, you know, imagine you were locked in an elevator with Kara. I appreciate. What a treat! <laughs> Oh, yeah. You definitely be having crumpets. Yeah, you can't <laughs> the option, walk into an elevator and you have just a few mere sentences to kind of explain what you think your style is, what you think you want people to take away from what you do. Because it's really hard to navigate that because you work with people, you see other things, you have to try and work out who you are. For me, I've just, I would, I'm just, I feel like I use classic techniques and maximize the ingredient to the best I can. So for instance, if I get the lamb saddle, I use absolutely everything. And that's what I've been drummed into, like maximizing it to the best you can and not overcomplicating things. So really I try and do three flavors. And if it's the three flavors and it's one tomato, I might maximize that tomato to different like textures or sweet and sour, uh, you know, anything crunch. And I try to, I try to not, be overcomplicated and you know I try to get the flavor as best as I can simple ingredients and you know I'm very lucky that I'm on the seafront and I get the best fish so you know that speaks for itself and I get the the best uh greedy carver duck which is around the corner and everything is comes to me every single day and I'm lucky that I can just turn the fish within a day because of how busy and how local everything comes. I get lobsters potting literally on the front here and they just come into the restaurant and I've got lobsters straight away. It's like, I'm very lucky to have the best produce and, you know, using just simple ingredients. Obviously Birmingham's got a pretty good coastline. Um, but yeah, like being able to cook sort of that closely with sort of the fish, like, you know. Yeah, it's amazing. Are, it's amazing. Obviously like I do, do a twist on simple flavors. Um, I try and do something different, but I feel like I've really hit this year. I feel like I've really made my stay true to myself, if that makes sense. Like from Master Chef to now, everyone you say, oh, you're, you know, what you sort of, what's your food? And I'm like, well, my food is just really good fucking food. Like just maximizing the best I can. And with the knowledge and the skills that I've learned, you know, using that, like using what you've drained out of the three Michelin star chefs. Like, it's so all I used to do, ask questions, even if it's a stupid one. I just used to drain the knowledge because when you are to where you are today, that's what you need. And they, and my four chefs do the same to me. They're, you know, they're draining my knowledge and it moves on. And that's how the industry works, I feel. It's like a little circle. And, you know, you've just got to try and complete it. <laughs> We've touched on the, the fact that you obviously have done competitions. So what is it about that that you enjoy? Um, I don't know. What, well, maybe you don't enjoy them. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think it's just the pressure and the buzz. I mean, doing a general service in the, in the kitchen is completely different to doing GBM or MasterChef. Like, you've really got to fucking move your ass. And if you haven't moved your ass, you ain't going to have anything on the plate. And I don't know. I just feel like... It's the passion, it's like you're going in and you're not just representing yourself, you're representing your restaurant, your team. And as long as I don't fuck up, no one else can, you know, if they don't like it, they don't like it. But I know that I've stayed true to myself and what I've done is to the best of my ability. But I just, I think I like the push and the drive and, you know, just getting in there, getting your head down and cracking on, I think. I think what Ellie says resonates. It's why I wanted to do it. I think just, they know like, you know, 
there's parts I liked when I, did, you know, my everyone's experience is different. Like, I enjoyed like getting to hang out at Paul Ainsworth. You know, he is truly a wonderful human being. And when I was yeah. trying to um, to do something to a camera, if it came anywhere near me, he was the one who taught me down. And um, you know, he was he was very supportive in in ways that I didn't deserve. Um, no, looking at that, I think I get it. I think it's just we've talked about it before, like, if you can do it the way you want to do it, yeah, then that's great. You know, I think I had a very coloured experience of it because, you know, I wasn't in the right headspace. I had too much else going on. And yeah, you know, look, Ellie, if you do do it again, I've tested it for you. Don't do ready, steady, cook for the first <laughs> of the Great British menu. It will not end well. Um, and yeah. you know, don't try and unite the themes of you know, sort of like heavy gothic horror with children. Those are the two takeaways not to do. Um, I don't know what I said last time. Like, I was meant to do it again last year and the team were gracious enough and kind enough to ask I wanted to do it again. Um, and I started doing it, but I don't, I don't know. I think it's just, you know, everyone grows up and like, you know. Yeah, it's one of them in it. I know what you're saying. And for me, I've watched GBM like, back in the day when Daniel Clifford did the street corner on the egg. And for me, it's like watching the best chefs in the country cooking. And it was fucking amazing, amazing. And like, obviously being asked to be on it is, is, is an achievement in itself. Like, even if you don't get through the first round, but it was stressful. Like I just literally got through by the skin of my teeth, literally. And the amount of work and the money and the pro, it's like, you know, you're cooking your food in the restaurant, beautiful, but you're cooking not just in a restaurant, in a kitchen you don't know, for a judge that you might have seen, but you may not know, for other people that might be, like, you might know him, you might not, and obviously every chef is judgy as fuck. And then you've got, <laughs> you've got, um, your, your, you've got all these props that you think's on the money, and then you do it and you guess, you, you know, you don't do very well. And it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's literally heartbreaking. Cause you feel yeah. like you hit the brief and obviously sometimes you don't hit the brief. It's, it's, it's difficult. I think for me, it's just, I think it's the, the, what lockdown's done to me is I think lockdown's made me more concerned about the business on mass. Um, to be honest, I, I think, you know, getting, just surviving through it and, and kind of getting older and feeling that kind of sense of duty throughout it. It's just like, I've got, you know, I've got a team that I want to make sure that they're still getting looked after and that we can come back. And I think like, for me, it was sort of, as you say, like, you know, spending like, you know, a hell of a lot on props, et cetera, like that's all good. But I guess I just got to that point where I sort of like, look, the problem is that I would not put any of these dishes on my menu ever. I don't want to do gimmick dishes. I don't want to do sort of like, you know, a dish where some mackerel tartare pops out of a spring box and hits you in the eye. And, you know, and then oh it's- Oh my God, like, like- You know, <laughs> I suppose that's just sort of like, the, full disclosure, I'm like, when I was younger, I think probably I was more of a prick and I kind of cared a lot more for like the profile of it. Like, and mm. it's hard to say, but like, I think I've been there. I think I've been at that point where like, you know, for a little period of time, you sort of like, yeah, you know, I want to be kind of all the rest of it. And I don't know, I think it's in a different place. Like I'm happy to to do media or whatever stuff, grateful to be asked, but I'll only really do if it benefits the business. If it's just yeah. actually the thrill of it, I kind of felt a bit like, well, you know, had a taste of it, didn't actually love it. Um, and I think for me, I'm like, if you go into these things and you've got a goal, like whatever that goal is, then it makes sense. For me, I think it's just, yeah, like, you know, I got, I got slowly broken down and, you know, managed to age 40 years over the course of about 18 months. And, yeah. You know, but at this point, my goal is sort of just, you know, get the restaurant the best possible place it can be, you know, support the team and then hopefully withdraw to be, um, you know, living in some sort of cave from the age of 40 where I don't have to interact with humanity. Um, and obviously for that, <laughs> I don't really need any more, um, you know, any more TV bits. I just have to learn how to whittle. <laughs> um, but no, it, it is a ride. And like, you know, I think it's very easy. Like, Ellie, you crap me up. We sort of like, you know, what chefs like they're judging. Yeah, we, we all can be. It's a really hard job, isn't it? And it's, it's 
sometimes it's very easy under think. pressure and yeah. you know but, but yeah is until you've done it no one can, can capture exactly i say that to the team it's like until you've actually done it yeah. it's master chef and you know i would we i'll be honest i've said it and then you're like what the hell was that guy doing last night to that thing or that bloody uh um well you know the skills test and you're like oh my god blah blah but until you're actually in that room and you've got 10 cameras looking at you and you're sweating literally like oh my fucking god like i can't even make a fucking tart here like and the microphone courses as well you know like being yeah. normal, and then like, the cameramen are like are you okay and i'm like no i'm not <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's unique i did enjoy gbm like i did really it's completely different um i think i was lucky that i did camera work before so i knew what i was expecting i knew that there was going to be loads of cameras in my face and you know but yeah. I was so fast that they pretty much didn't try to like, you know, if I thought, fuck, I don't want them, I'm gonna get that in a fucking piping bar quickly, you know, so they don't fucking look. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but yeah, I think if they ask me, I will do it again, purely based well, on- To be honest, Eddie, I'm thinking you might want to compete for the Midlands because I'm never going to do it. And it'd be nice to see it come home for the Midlands. How about, <laughs> would you like to become an adopted Brummie? <laughs> yeah, I'll come up and be a sous chef. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be your kitchen porter, mate. Like, honestly, I'm, I'm more groovy. I'll just sit in the background polishing things. Yeah. I found my comfort level for this. Yeah. Uh, Ellie, we touched briefly on of staff and you said, obviously, having the shortage of staff. Um, so I just want to know what your point of view on it is. is how do we attract more, I want to say young people, but just more people back I mean, into hospitality, do you think? It is a tough one. Um, sort of, I've joined up with HIT training. Um, I've never worked, I never known about HIT training until I came here. Um, it's almost, it's a course and you can be on this course any age up to 99, which is quite weird. Um, but basically I <laughs> work with the, with the company and we looked for two young chefs. It doesn't like, it didn't matter how old you were. Um, and we got, well, I'm lucky that I got two. Um, I mean, it's, it's such a difficult question but I feel like COVID really hasn't helped. And most of my friends, you know, have messaged me, they've stopped being a chef because they had more money doing delivering or I don't know, helping their friends do something else. And I feel like not many people are attracted to our lifestyle. Now to be in our lifestyle, it's, it's either you, it's a passion, it's a love, and you really want to do what you're doing and achieve the goal that you're wanting to achieve um but i don't know i have been lucky i've really attracted like young females like from colleges and i don't know maybe it's something because they've seen me on telly or they see the restaurant or you know i try to advertise as much as i can um but i don't know it is a difficult one i feel like there is less chefs out there and a lot less women um i just but, that, that, but, but that's an elephant in the room that like I'm not equipped to, to comment, like, you know, I've, I've been very lucky to have some really, really talented women mm -hmm. in and some really talented men, but like, you know, Louise Ellis, who was, um, oh, yeah, mom, great. Uh, you know, Lou was, you know, Lou was an alumni and like, you know, super talented, like Poppy, who's now like a massive multinational TikTok star, like Poppy yeah, yeah. Like Pops was with us and she was amazing. You know, so many like Dan, Chloe has just opened a restaurant here. So I kind of, I know it exists, but I think like, yeah, elephant in the room, like it is, it is hard to, I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to go and kill a small dog. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's definitely a problem. I sort of think like, you know, it was, yeah. it was luck versus judgment. I do think it sort of helped once we had a couple of sort of, you know, um, you know colleagues who, who were women, I guess that's the whole point of having a more diverse kitchen that if you've got more diversity, people feel like they can belong there more. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. you know, what, why do you think as a sector, like we have struggled to not just be basically a massive sausage fest? I'm using the lingo here. Yeah. But... I mean, as a young female, I just, I joined in, I, I fell into it. I, it wasn't probably something I was going to pick when I was at college. I didn't even do food at college or school. Like I just fell into it because I was working in a, a pub and it was something that, you know, oh, I actually really like to cook it. Maybe it's something I want to do. And then 
you know, I'm quite I'm sort of quite strict on myself anyway like I just want to be the best I can and I keep wanting to improve and improve and improve and like when I was younger and I say it to the guys um this if I was 17 18 or 19 and I'd look at my sous chef at the time I'd be like right when I'm your age when I'm their age I want to be better or like I'd always think that I want to be better than who who and what and why and exactly to the point of you know where I am today I want them to be better than me at my age. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's tough. And I do really want a lot more women to come into the industry. Um, you know, I do talk to a lot of colleges. I'm in with HIT training, it's, you know, but with HIT training, there was like, I don't know, three girls, literally. Yeah. And I feel like when you're 16, I feel like most young girls want to go out partying or they want to go and do other things. And I just don't think our hospital like the industry is an appealing to a young girl or lady or even a gentleman because of what's going on over social medias like social media is a big thing and they're like mm, no if I want Saturday I want Saturday night off to go to my party or something and you can't have a Saturday night off you can't like you know you're working and sometimes the hours don't attract people like you know for me, it's not about the hours. Like, you know, if you've got to work it, you've got to work it. But as a young person, I don't feel like that's an appealing. And, you know, you're trying to really push. You know, I, I don't know. What do you think, Al? It's the same. It's a difficult one. But I think it's, it's, I th I think it's incredibly complicated. I think it's short term really problematic for us to come yeah. out of COVID and then be dealing with, like, well, for no us dealing with brexit no staff yeah more aware than ever that perhaps the cost and reward doesn't quite tally up in the way that it should so i think like it's, it's really hard short term i mean we've kind of used it to go on a bit of a sort of crusade to try and future proof so we've gone through we've done i oh, have done a pay review we've given everyone in the company a yeah, ride exactly, yep. um, we've kind of now just navigating through like private healthcare dental um and kind of really tracking the hours to try and work out what it is. I, I think there will always be a conflict that to do the food at no, any level yeah. that I would want to do, like the hours. I it's, I think the hours is just- The hours a little bit, um, you know, I think if you want to charge like 700 pound a head, we can have double teams and do like three days on three off. But, exactly. the, you know, for all the consumers who want to see us be progressive, I'm not certain they're yet willing to commit economically. Um, but I think there's all that going on. And I do think as well like this, I don't think it's a positive long-term for the industry. Maybe some of these uncomfortable conversations around like, but what are we doing for our teams? You know, what are the habits that are like perhaps pretty fucking shitty that, you know, are, are somehow normalized under sort of yeah. the, it is what it is. And, you know, all this sort of stuff that when you're going through kitchens, you sort of, you hear and, you know, like you believe it as well, right? Like for years, for years, I genuinely like, I'd listen to the expression of, oh, it is what it is. And I'd be like, oh, it must be, that's the saying. And I then I came back from COVID and I'd be like, well, why does it have to be that way? Like, why don't we rip it apart and see how it can fit differently? Um, so Teddy, you're going in a casserole, behave. <laughs> you know, so I, I think it's a long, hard fight. Um, yeah. I think it's a lot around talking to young people in the industry and asking what kind of appeal to them but also what sort of scares them. Um, I think it also probably is on all of us to kind of really check our shit a little bit and kind of perhaps ask difficult questions and then do something with it. But yeah, you're right. I, I think change is positive, right? You know, I'd love to see kitchens as, you know, my biggest bugbear. So I've got a real chip on my shoulder because um, I came into cooking in a bit of a funky way. And as much as I was, uh, I cooked a bit at university, sort of enjoyed it. Um, I then took a job as, a, as an accountant for a like massive corporate firm um, and I lasted just over a year and I was like I can't do this at least you can add up <laughs> well you know I can identify a number between one and six so that that. <laughs> oh yeah shit <laughs> um, but you know like I think I've got a chip on my shoulder because you know I remember I, I, I literally felt like shit because when I when I kind of quit when I quit um that job, like nobody supported it, man. Like my parents sort of tried to, but you can see their total malcomprehension while you'd walk away from like 
suit and tie office job maybe you get to drive a nice Peugeot on company like I don't know um and I feel like I went to the sort of school where you become a doctor or a solicitor or you know I you know I was very fortunate enough to kind of be the albeit the poor kid but like in kind of quite a nice la di da school um and I think like for me like my vision is I want people to realize that hospitality is every bit as rewarding as challenging as yeah. kind of professional as like doing these 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 office jobs right I don't want a generation of kids who are creative and dynamic and brilliant and have vision to feel like to be successful they must surely become a mid-level manager for a massive multinational company because that does not happy communities make right yeah. um, and it's sort of you know we've done a lot of work of kind of actually going well, we've got some, some, you know, some younger team members who are like, you know, 18, 19, 20. Yeah, same. And, and I'm sort of there going, well, we need to put together a package. So when they go to their friends who are stuck working in like an office job, they're making more money. They're having more fun. They're learning more. So we can start to tie that, like, you know, like whatever, that, you know, that, that floppy head twat in power said, oh, you know, it's low skilled labor. Like, it's not, man. Like, I'm telling you now. Like, yeah. Yeah. Working as an accountant was easier than working as a commie, right? It's it's so far from it. And I kind of feel like if overall we're now on a trajectory where we're going to kind of actually make this industry something where kind of people take us seriously, because I think that's it. You know, I think we've been shown a lot of times real contempt from the government, you know, um, yeah. even in the last year, let's face it, that they're like, could we open up? Because we're actually very safe and secure. Oh, afraid not. <laughs> you've opened up like a 2000 person retail shop no. well, that's different because the clothes can't catch covid yeah i, I know that but you know, it is contempt um and i feel like there is some real pain to come if we want to you know create real structural change um but like i think the outcome could be worth it yeah i know um but i mean in short i've got an easy fix um yeah. I just you know I just keep asking you all with the hope that someone will go well actually <laughs> this is how we do it <laughs> uh, it's like Dartmouth so seasonal and yeah. obviously the summer we are rammed like literally rammed um of, and in the winter it sort of dies off but we're actually getting that balance where it's the same sort of all year round now um but in the summer we well Technically, Monday, Tuesday, we're closed, so Monday they have off. But today we're in because we've got to do prep because we're, like, obviously, chef, two chefs down. So they've constantly been working six days a week till September. But it, it's such a difficult thing. You know, it's even, like, you need to try and make the restaurant as successful as you can. And then awards come. So, like, when we first joined, they all had a pay rise. Um, in the winter, we have three days off a week um, till next February. Um, and really, when it's the three days off a week, it comes to the point where it's like the award time and we all go out and eat to so go to the Mariners and we all have trips or we go to Trenchman's. And it's like that time is where it's all special because, you know, you've got the time off and they've worked so bloody hard in the summer. And it's where you give back the, you know, the well done to your staff and it's that's really cool man i, I really mean yeah. yeah nice and we did it last year and obviously it's going to be a bit tough this year without craig but i know for a fact that they love working here and i'm the first one in i'm the last one out and i try to you know the hours is a thing that i think every chef has opinion on the hours whether we do work our over hours or we don't or whatever but i think every restaurant is different so you can't judge every restaurant on what hours you work. Like, I just try to keep the hours down as best as I can. But sometimes it's a struggle. It is. Sometimes we are working a lot of hours in the day. But I just know for a fact in the winter time, it's not an excuse, but in the winter, I know that I know my chefs are having three days off a week and they can fucking enjoy their days off without stressing or coming into work. Um, and it's one of them. It's a tough, it's a tough cookie, I think. I don't think there's a right or wrong way, but actually I think, I know it sounds daft, but I think if like we all just had really honest conversations like this, I think that's probably how it starts, right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Not, not like defensive conversations, but just kind of going like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, it is tough. We all know, 
exactly. We all know every chef in the country is working more than they should be working. But that's, you know, I've done that since God knows how long. And it's something I'm used to, but it's not what they're used to. And I think that's not what's the more appealing is people are want, thinking they're expected to work 70, 80 hours a week. It's, you know, we're in the 21st century now. It's not, it's not normal. It's, no one works those amount of hours. You know, if you go and talk to your friends and family who does hairdressing or something like that, they don't work those hours, do they? No, you know, and I, I don't think we'll ever be a light, an industry that's light on hours, but I guess there's ways, you know, you can do it. And like, you know, I really like to actually the idea and I'm going to go and think about it. I don't think it will work because we're not so seasonal, but I love the idea of having like, like hard season, easy season. Or yeah, like, and that's what you exactly, do, yeah. Anything you can do to sort of say to the team, like, because that's actually the biggest thing we've done differently is as opposed to trying to second guess what they want like every week we sit with everyone on the team and we kind of go you know and it's a scary exercise but we'll literally be like can you tell us what we're doing the worst can yeah you tell us what we're doing the shittest and the first couple of weeks man like that's really uncomfortable because it's like every week you're like, i'm off to work to get criticized you know but, but you're so right and it's it's something I've learned this year. And since we've opened, I gave it a couple of months. And in June, one of the chefs was asking me like, oh, you know, Ellie, this, this and this. And I was like, right guys, we're gonna have a meeting next Tuesday. And I'm gonna show you how much we need to make every single day to show you the ins and outs of a restaurant. And it's so important that we have to make a certain amount. We need to make a certain amount on the food. We need to make this, you know, and now they understand like it's not just about cooking it's about managing the team and cooking's the easy part i find it's like if you can drive you can definitely fucking cook and if you know where if you've you know if you come in and you're eager that's the easy part it's it's maintaining the team and trying to manage them to the best you can and i feel like they've all learned what we generally need to do as a business to run and why we need to make this money. Why have we got to do this? You know, why are you breaking the thermo, right? Well, that costs. It's like, I've, it's like little, little things to me, they're the most important. And those things, like the kicking, the cooking's the easy side, isn't it? Yeah. You know, as, and all four of them, are, you know, they're stars in themselves and I'm very proud of them. Well, for what it's worth, I think it sounds like doing a hell of a lot right. And well, I'm trying. I think I am. <laughs> you've come to that conclusion a lot faster than than some of us, um, you know, some of us older who who wish they'd have got to where your thinking's at. They <laughs> might watch this and go, "You are chatting shit." <laughs> like, no, I'm not. And you'll then be like, "Get back in your cage." I'll be like, oh, "Take the little minis now." <laughs> nah, but yeah, I think you're right. It's like staff is a big problem and hopefully you know in a couple yet by the end of the year middle of summer next year we might be able to attract the younger generation and I think it's mostly getting them into colleges and doing demos and you know you see all these things online and it's even like reading or watching this as a young person like everyone's like oh let's look at staff canteen and you attract people and I think it's one of those that I know or you hate television or something, but all these sort of things attract people to come and work for you. And I find that's quite a big plus as well. I, mean, like, I don't hate TV at all. I just think um, I've got a big mouth and it doesn't <laughs> necessarily benefit me any, any kind of further. But <laughs> oh, you know, I think, I think it's, we need, it's why we need like, you know, the best variety possible of people yeah. having it lots of different ways. We need to move past the idea that you know, success has one particular color, one particular cadence, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, only then, like, you know, if only a couple of people just, you know, they, they, you know, they, they, they see you on GBM or, you know, they, they kind of come across, you know, yeah. someone, you know, someone telling it as it is and resonating in a little way, like, God knows that could be, you know, that could be the next sort of, you know, absolute superstar. No, you're, okay. I know, yeah. You're right. I think that's Oh, that's the part where I'm still positive, which I know you don't think I am, Cara, but I'm actually very much sunshine and light. Um, you know, we all have the ability to change it and we can kind of change it daily. Um, and uh, yeah, for what it's worth, like, you know, look, you know, everything I've heard, everything I've read, everything I've come across, Ellie, you more than live up to it, mate. I can't wait to get down and eat with you. 
Thank you. Ellie, I can't, I can't uh, let you go without talking about, uh, obviously you had the pleasure of working with the Tanners. Um, <laughs> speaking of chefs on, on TV, obviously they were <laughs> some of the originals there, but um, what's your best uh, uh, Tanner Brothers story? Because I bet you've got a few. Okay, no. Um, I don't know. I'll go with, like, Chris for me is like, he's so important. We speak to each other twice a week on the phone. And if I have a problem or, you know, what do you think I should do? Like, I always, he, he's just one of those, he's so relaxed and, you know, we're, we'll be on the phone on a Saturday night till half, like half 12, quarter to one in the night, just chatting pure shit. Fucking hell, Eddie, I've had, you know, push up like no chefs or, I don't know. It's just a joy to hear that it's not just you in, in trouble. Like everyone's experiencing it and there is tough things, but um, Chris is like one of those chefs, like you just, if you're in the shit, you just bring him up and he cheers you up. And that's been pretty much the last month, to be fair. But um, yeah, so I started Chris and James when, oh God, when I was 17, 16, something like that. And we was, I was on pastry and um, I, it was a afternoon and we all, we all had like, I don't know, an hour split, two hours split. So I go off home and I put the heating on because it was fucking freezing that day literally pissing down with rain so I thought well I put the heater on and I ended up falling asleep so I woke up and I was like quite blase I was like oh yeah whatever and I had a voicemail and I was like oh what the fuck's a voicemail and I was like it's like hello Ellie uh this is Chris your boss um you're actually an hour late where are you and I'm like fuck fuck so I've overslept I go running into work fucking quarter to eight and all of them are clapping like this on the path. Wee, wee. <laughs> and like Chris has set me up and literally I walk in and Chris is like, you know, Ellie, it's just like, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And he set me up. I literally, he didn't even sh like shout because he, he thought it was hilarious because you can see that, like, I must have had a pillow or something. <laughs> Hello, some sort of sofa mark on my face and I thought I'm gonna get the sack I'm gonna get the sack I've only worked there like three months and I was like ringing my dad I was like dad I'm gonna get the sack I've just I'm late and I was the thing is I was more fucking shit in it I was gonna be like losing my job than him and there was like all of them there's like 10 of them like Wee, get in, get in. <laughs> I literally I walk into the kitchen and they're halfway through service it was like Chris is like right I've set you up now come on push on cue and uh, that's about it really but yeah, like I do pub in the park with them or like anything they they obviously have Kentish hair up there. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we're just really good friends now. Obviously he was my mentor at the time, but we've just become like really close and whatever we can do to support each other. Like, you know, we try and do that, but not any naughty ones really. They are, they're good, they're really, really nice pair. I do enjoy bumping into them. They're always good fun. They're always up for a laugh and they always have a good story. So I just, that's why I wanted to just have a yeah. quick chat with you about them as well. Um, final question, Ellie, what's what's next for you? Because you're obviously very driven throughout this. I've definitely got that from you. You've focused, you know what you want. You want to be the best at what you do. What um, What's the, the next kind of challenge for you? I mean, still doing what we do best. And I love, you know, looking after the customers and maintaining that, um, happy atmosphere in the restaurant but you know really I would my aim is to like get the restaurant back to what it used to be and there used to be a cookery school next to the restaurant when John Burton Race had it he had the restaurant on the bottom which I'm in now um restaurant on the top and then the top floor used to be a cookery school okay. now for me, I've done I've sort of I know that quite well because we I used to do it at Luckland Park with how and you know teach people and I feel like there's a good um customer base here in Dartmouth for that and I feel like people really do like to learn how to cook and for me I would like to have um my own cookery school at the top um maybe a bar underneath but that's like long-term plan but for now it's just like maintaining the restaurant being busy um you know accolades coming along the way and just having a general good time and you know coming to work and being proud of what I've done and you know the team is just one of those really yeah well I have no doubt that you will achieve everything that you set your mind to um but uh, thank you so much for for doing the podcast today I've really enjoyed it 
Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been really good fun. Sorry I'm on mute. This is the rain. Thank you for inviting me, Alex. You're very welcome. Um, I will be down to see you if we ever yeah, resolve nice something better. crisis um, so I can be off. But yeah, like, keep doing what you do, man. It's such an There is something I do need to admit. Um, we were all laughing and joking earlier because I was telling everyone I was doing this. And they said, oh, who's Alex? I said, oh, I'll go on his Instagram. So I was like going on his Instagram. I was like, well, this is what he does. I said, his food is nothing like mine. And <laughs> I said, look at his banana photo. And they're all fucking pissing themselves because I was showing them a photo. And obviously, because I was on your Instagram, I ended up liking your photo. And I was like, oh, fucking hell, guys. I said, he's going to think I'm stalking him now, for fuck's sake. <laughs> um, I didn't until you said that. <laughs> so if you see any liking photos, it's just the team. We're all having a little stalk just, on your profile. Stalk. That's, we'll allow it. We'll allow it. <laughs> right. Thank you both very much. Um, right. I'll, Alex, I'll speak to you soon. Ellie, good luck with everything. Thank and hopefully you. I'll catch up with you soon as well. Thank you. Uh, cheers.